So you take in a bunch of healthy people, you subject them to a bunch of questioning, you set the table for um, the experiment, they take the capsules, and what did you find? Well, let's see. So psilocybin, as we certainly expected, <clears throat> produced the whole array of psychedelic-like effects. So there's visual phenomena, visual distortions, visual imagery comes up. There may be greater emotionality, and that can be uh, very positive, sometimes transcendent-like experiences, but also experiences of fear or or uh, or you know un unstabilizing kinds of experiences, um, and uh, and then there can be somatic effects. The sense of body has changed, uh, and there can also be cognitive changes, uh, and uh, and so people can think and imagine different things, and including. Uh, including uh, some paranoid thinking that comes that's very low but that can occur so all those all those kinds of effects occurred and then at the end of the day we gave people a, a whole set of questionnaires uh, and one set of questionnaires had been developed uh, originally to measure mystical experiences uh, brought about naturally. These are religious type of mystical experiences. Uh, and we've since refined that questionnaire, and we call it the mystical experience questionnaire. But what was really interesting is that people endorsed very highly the components of, of a mystical experience that had been described by religious people throughout the ages uh, in terms of discussing these. And we could talk about the qualities of those, but the, you know, the key quality is this uh, s sense of connectedness to, to everything. Uh, and, and that can be experienced uh, as a connection with the divine in, in religious uh, terminology it doesn't doesn't have to be but so there's a sense of the interconnectedness of all things that we're all in this together there's a sense that that experience is precious it's um to put in religious language it's sacred or deserving of reverence and then another feature is that the experience feels authentically true and people have these experiences and and say it feels more real than everyday waking reality. So mm -hmm. those are the features. They they came out, uh, you know, but by the end of the day, those become memories, right? Now here's what was astonishing to me. I I at this point in my career, I had assessed a lot of people at high doses of all kinds of different psychoactive drugs and so i so i uh, i know how to measure subjective effects i know what to expect from them uh and here's what was interesting people would come back two months later because the way the study was designed there were two or three sessions so they're coming back two months later uh preparing for a second session and i sit down and i ask them well what you know, what do you remember about that, you know, your first session? And the people who got psilocybin, I was blinded to who received what, but the people who got psilocybin would say, oh, I remember that like it was yesterday. Uh, that was what, that's one of the most important experiences of my life. <laughs> and I, had, and so here I, I'm a skeptic. I've not, I've now heard stories about psychedelics, uh, but I I wasn't prepared for that. What so? What does it mean? This was one of the most important experiences of your life, and so my immediate <laughs> my immediate judgmental reaction was, "What kind of life has this person <laughs> person had?" It, but no, they would say, "Well, you know, it's on par with the, you know, the death of my parent." just recently my father passed you know or the um the birth of my firstborn child um and you go what this this was a 
six hour session in a in a in a faux living room like environment at Johns Hopkins and it's among the most meaningful experiences of your life and indeed that's that's kind of the core finding that there's something about these experiences that are remarkable in terms of how they're imprinted and remembered and then the attributions that people make to those experiences so i'd never i'd never seen anything like that it hadn't occurred to me when we started the study even to assess for something like that and then we started developing scales how important is this experience on a life you know lifetime of experiences from you know like an everyday experience to goes up to you know within the 10 most meaningful experience of my life five or the single most well yeah in that study and then there was something about spirituality in that study 30 percent of the people said that the experience was the single most spiritually significant experience of their entire life and about 80 percent of people in those studies Mm -hmm. say it's in the top five most meaningful and spiritual significant uh, of their lives and that's that can i I just ask you like back up back up a little bit because when you're describing what they're experiencing now i want to know you know how how did it get so significant i'm picturing what you see when you look through a kaleidoscope I'm picturing, you know, 1970s TV animations, you know, <laughs> um, Picasso's. This is, what I, this is what's coming to mind as the images that would be flashing through your head with the eye mask on. Not it? Like, what? what's actually it, being seen? <laughs> well, one of the features, Megan, of these experiences that d- defines them is that they're ineffable. The, f- the first thing that people say is that I, I can't even describe it. And so what you just described were were experiences all in the visual realm, but this goes beyond that. There may be people who have no visions at all, but yet these experiences take on that sense of, of meaning. So I don't think we understand well enough, and certainly on neuroscience isn't refined well enough to know yeah, precisely what components of these experiences result in this uh, incredible meaning making. And but in terms of visualization, I mean that can show up in in innumerable different ways. Uh, and it, it can it can show up just as a carnival like, you know, atmosphere. Uh, but you know, it can also, you know, turn to sacred, you know, s- sacred imagery, uh, you know, or a, a sense of approaching something that is just beyond description. And so for religiously inclined, they might they might use the word God and encounter with so you don't, God. You don't have to steer them. So if, uh, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but if you're going to use this to help somebody with stopping smoking or uh, addressing their anorexia, do you have to steer them? Like we're going to conquer the smoking, picture the cigarette, you know, or or even in this study. Well, forget that. Let me start again. If you're dealing with depression, do you need to sort of yeah. say we're going to focus on your depression so that you're kind of pushing them toward resolving the thing you're targeting? Yeah, great, <laughs> great questions. Um, let's see. So in therapeutic studies, there's uh, a built-in intention for the the for the, the session, and that is good. It's going to be helpful for them in terms of managing uh, whatever therapeutic condition they have. Now, uh, now there's also uh, research underway for approval of MDMA or ecstasy for treatment of PTSD. And now, the, and that's a, it's not a classic psychedelic. It's kind of like psychedelics though, but, but there the therapy session very <clears throat> explicitly uh, focuses on, or the expectation is that people are going to talk about their traumatic experience. Mm. 
With a drug like psilocybin, we don't invite people to talk at all. I mean, if and if some people are moved to talk, uh, we'll listen. But very often, <laughs> uh, as soon as you start putting something in the ineffable range into words, it pulls you out of the experience. Yeah. So our That's... counsel to people is to just stay with the experience, just trust trust the process, be interested and curious about it. Think about that. So the if somebody goes in, and we'll talk about the anxiety, depression, but somebody goes in to do this to see if it'll help with depression, and then you don't have to direct them. The mind knows what to do. It, it like trust in your in your mind and your soul and the psilocybin working their magic without any specific push or direction. That to me is so remarkable. What's your gift going to be this Valentine's Day? How about taking 10 or 15 years off your appearance with Genucel Skincare and their most popular package? And right now, every most popular package, all their best stuff is 70% off, 70, and includes the next breakthrough in skincare technology, Genucel's Probiotic Moisturizer, absolutely free. These super ingredients found in yogurt can have the same nourishing benefits and goodness for your skin, right? You eat the yogurt, you get the probiotic, and you can do this on your skin too with probiotic extracts that can target bad bacteria on the surface of your skin to restore balance to your skin's microbiome for a noticeably clearer complexion and visibly younger appearance. See those fine lines, wrinkles, dark spots, sagging jawline, even bags and puffiness visibly disappear right before your eyes, thanks to Genucel. Plus, with its immediate effects product, see results in under 12 hours guaranteed or your money back. Go to genucel.com slash MK60 right now. And for the first time ever, every order at genucel.com from now through Valentine's Day will include a beauty box with two, count them, two luxury gifts for free. Order now, two weeks only, genucel.com slash MK60. G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash M-K-6-0. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.